In this episode, we want to go inside of Cinema and create exactly there an HDRI. So you can use this as an image instead of having objects all the time active in a scene. And the beauty of that is when you have an image, you can go into Photoshop or in Body Paint and change maybe some parts of the image change the color, change maybe some clouds with the stem tool and so on. So I have here the physical sky. It is this object here, but I took it from the content browser. And you might need to install, of course, the presets there to get exactly all these presets here in this folder. I don't want to go into details for the physical sky. I have used here the evening sun preset as it is I do not have changed anything so you can follow along when you just open this or you use maybe something that is more along to your liking okay let's have a look when we render this just out without doing anything we get this guy here and the beauty of that is of course that we have now here 32 bit per channel directly to our fingertips that's perfect without any further problems. So how to get an image from that? There's one method of course to create with a sphere just a map. <laughs> and it's of course not exactly that simple and I want to show you where we run into a short little problem. I press H to center this here. And when I have the sphere here selected, I like to have tons of polygons for that, maybe 128 or so. Really, tons of, <laughs> but not too much. And I make this editable, and it's just a standard setting for it. And I go then here in display and take a look. Now we have all these little squares here. Very nice, because that gives the image finally a huge stability. There is one problem, as I said, that is what we need to overcome, and that is here inside of the pole cap. And that has to do with triangulated polygons. And when I go now for a second here into Body Paint UV Edit, and choose here my show UV Mesh, <laughs> then I can see here clearly, and I use 1 and 2 as the shortcuts to move here around, that we have triangles here. And exactly in these triangles, Cinema 4D will write, of course, the information. So we have here a fringe on the pole caps. And it never really works out nicely, especially when you want to use those images, maybe just for a presentation or for a print. The pole caps, they are not only distorted like hell, as the projection method provokes it, but we have also this seam here. So we have to work against uh, this seam. So I go here back to my startup and what we can do here to select all these triangles is of course to go to edit, project info, structure, nothing selected here. <laughs> so I go here again with the polygons selected, have the sphere selected, go to project info, and then I get here exactly this interface. And I want to have all triangles selected. Done. <laughs> 256 triangles and both. As we can see, the axis is not in this area. So we have both here selected. Press H to get everything centered. And again, <laughs> so you can see we have here also this. What I want to do is just to press the delete button. And that sounds maybe a little bit weird because we get a black hole then inside of that. But let's check out first before we complain. We got rid of all these triangles here. And that is exactly where I was after. And I will show you that how to fix this then later in Photoshop or in Body Paint. It's pretty simple if you know how. Okay, so back to my startup menu. And I go here just to the frame default to get this centered here in my scene. And if you want to have uh, this map here for an object, that means when you go, for example, into new materials, 
and you want to have that in the environment channel, then this sphere should be where the object is at the moment. The object needs to be invisible, to be not inside or outside at the same time of that sphere. And then this sphere can collect the data from the surrounding area. And you can use this then inside of the environment map, which results in a very fast reflection modus with some limitations, of course, because it's a fake and fake means we save maybe some time, but we have to deal with some individual uh, <laughs> qualities to name it politely. Okay, that's not the theme here. We want to go here now and prepare everything for the baking process. So I check here on only reflection and I leave it exactly as it is. Nothing else, no Fresnel or Fresnel in the way you want to pronounce it. And I close this. Then I take this material onto the sphere, make a little check so I can see here everything and I get here my black dot. And again, I don't want to have anything with triangles in it. And I could make this smaller, but it's not so important. Pole caps are always a problem and they should have always especially tension finally. So what we need to do here is to select the sphere if not already done. And then we go to Tags, Cinema for d Tags and to Bake Texture. And here I would like to have of course a path where I want to save it. Normally we should do this directly into a project folder for this tutorial here. I say only sphere and maybe reflection and give it a number. So we have options to use this name more than often. I like of course OpenEXR and that means we should have everything in a linear color space or linear light. The width and the height should be always that the width is twice in size than the height. You can change this of course, but common practice is that this results in the best quality finally. So let's keep it small here, 2K by 1K and 1K is always 1024. And we could increase the quality by setting up super sampling. Just one or two is enough, no border pixels or just one is, you can leave it out because it has no borders here practically. And then we can go already to the options. Inside the options, we check on only reflection. That's all. The use of the camera vector means that any camera that is active for the rendering will create a complete different result from the view of the camera. That would be needed if you want to have a probe. But then you can use the camera directly to render the chrome sphere and create a probe from it. Okay, so we want to have exactly a reflection as this would reflect only perpendicular to the surface or in a normal direction. And then we have to press only the bake. That's all. And then it starts already calculating and you see here on the top and on the end we will have a wide area. That's with the border pixels, <laughs> so to say. This is all. So now we have to fix this. So let's open a new scene and check out what happens if we take here just the standard sphere with no change. <laughs> I go here with a new material, check on only luminance and check off everything else, stay in luminance and go here to load image. And then I take my freshly overwritten image, no white seams here or dark, whatever if you set up in the baking process. And then I drag this to the sphere. That's all. And then I want to see what happens. Option key here and press the two key, the one key to move it, render it and I get a nice little dot here. <laughs> Perfect. So when you click here now to seamless, and then this dot should be away. If not, you have to fiddle maybe a little bit here with this option one time above or down should do the trick. If not, maybe sometimes it helps to just change the hexahedron and here then to spherical. 
and it's always a little problem in the poll caps. So let's go here. One and three and one as a shortcut again. And it's pretty clean here. So I would think this is done and we can use this now to our advantage, of course. So I take this away. I go here to frame default, put here my little figure into the scene, create just a standard material without any adjustments and take here now the sky object, take my object here on it and switch on in effects the global illumination, switch this off and here we go. That's quite simple, I think. And that brings us then to theme number two. So this is maybe a little bit more difficult. And for that, we need here, of course, just something to work with. And I go here to my desktop again. And you can place in any 360 to by 180 degree image. And I open this here. We could use also the one that we have just used, but I think after a while it gets a little bit boring. So we put this in and I place this here, of course, inside. And we need, of course, to check if that is here checked to negative. So we have the right orientation in it. This goes on a sphere here and this represents now my environment. That could be large, big, that could be objects, whatever. So I don't want to see it here at the moment because I want to explain what I've done here. These are six cameras. All of these cameras are exactly on the same position, zero, zero, zero. And wherever you need the center point of your panorama, maybe that is an object or something like that, all these cameras should be in the same way. So, and I have used then here a foreground object, which you can't see at the moment. And this foreground object has seven materials on it. <laughs> One is just for text. You can delete this if you like. And then we have six materials. And I'll show you one of these materials. It has in the luminance channel just the camera shader in it. And the camera itself is then populated, or the camera shader itself is then populated with each of these cameras. So when I click here on another one, you can see here camera three is in this one and so on. So, to show what I'm talking about, I go now and render this here. And of course, based on that we want to have always a square here, I have to render this in square. So I render here this area for nothing. <laughs> Maybe there is a solution for that in Coffee or in another scripting language. This is the simplest way without Expresso, without anything else. It's just set up here the output side to a square format. And so we can have all these six cameras in one image finally. They render all to the foreground element. And as each of them looks in a different way, we want to have of course then each of these cameras exactly connected to each other. And that is why I show you that here when we go yeah, this is a cube now because the first room of each camera has exactly the same distance. And so they built here practically this cube. And you can imagine that this cube is now exactly what the unfolding of this image is here. So how to get the images now to this position? That's pretty simple. When we go to our texture tag, which is responsible for the positioning, then we can see here I have worked with the offset and I have changed the length, of course. So each of these pictures has a different offset. And so I placed these pictures step by step on exactly this area here. When I go then ahead and say, OK, I want to have here maybe this as output format and I want to save it here as an OpenEXR file, of course. And I want to go maybe with anti-aliasing in my game, everything fine. I can do that. And do I have specified where I want to have it? No. And I go here then to six side just for the moment. Double check. Yes, six side, save. And then I render this 
and I get here exactly this image. And this is maybe just an idea. Don't take it too seriously because I'm not really a friend of these black areas here. They take a lot of space away. But the beauty of this is you work practically six times within standard image. There's no real distortion in it. Of course, when you take a look here, where one to the other picture comes, that's a little bit tricky to work on. But if you want to work here, maybe to get this sign here out of the picture, you can do this in Photoshop very easily. It's not distorted, it's not just a bow. And I show you just for the fun again, the original picture. And here I go with open window. And so we have now created a method to go from N360 180 degree panorama to N cross one. And this is not an option that is natively given inside of Cinema 4D. We can go the other route around. And I want to show you that, of course, in a sec. So I go into Photoshop CS6, open my six sided window here or object. And then I have only to click here on my crop tool and go here pretty close to this corner. This should be done, of course, carefully because everything else depends then on that. If I screw that up, every other edge will be calculated in the wrong way. So I think that's for the moment OK. Press return. And I can use this black area here, of course, for information. But that should be all. I just save it. So I overwrite the information. I get rid of the black bar here. And then I hop back here to Cinema 4D and go to File. Or I can use here just this shortcut, six-sided. You see, I have here my cropped version. Open it and I get immediately this back. So you can see here, this what was what we have opened. And this is what we have created. It is mirror-sided here at the moment. And we have some tiny little problems in it. You might be careful with that because here is a little edge where the border was and here is an edge where the border was from one. And sometimes we can see here even a distortion from that. You need to be careful with those things. It's not super perfect. You can see here a little transition and the jump. But I wanted to give you an idea how things like that work and how you can do those cross panoramas if you like because you can use now anything that is in your Cinema 4D scene and you can back it out as a panorama. I have shown you now two ways to do so and as long as you use both ways just for reflection maybe and for the illumination that should be that should work fine. For backgrounds I'm not really certain if we can really achieve the highest quality that you need maybe if you work in a 4K project because then one time around is a huge file. But anyway, try it out. Check your options with that and how it works in your project. Maybe it is something where you can take advantage from. Thanks for listening. See you in the next part.